excited to have you this afternoon. And the planning of this group, has, uh, the planning of this meeting has been very special for these rural residents. It has involved the working together of two advisory committees on, on topics that are relevant to health and welfare of, of aging citizens. We're excited for the three unique topics that we came together. The Health, of, health Affairs Advisory Committee that we will call HAC, H-A-C, <laughs> okay. and also EPAC, Emergency Preparedness Advisory Committee. Those two committees report to the Alicia World, World Board, and both of those committees have different charges and different uh, programs, usually. Uh, with the two advisory committees have, have, have their chairs, and they will be introduced to you soon. But the, the contemporary issues that we are dealing with today are emergency preparedness and prevention. And emergency preparedness now is not only a national, but it's an international issue. And we, if we, uh, when, we con when we conceived the issue that we wanted to, to deal with today, we were thinking about trying to reduce emergency co medical calls and also emergency room utilization by, that was unnecessary. The second issue was uh, prevention, and prevention as it related to falls. And we chose falls this time because there are so many unnecessary falls or preventable falls by patient education and also by changing in behaviors. And so that was the second issue that we dealt with, which brought these two advisory committees together. Now the third thing that we did was to try to do a workshop and most of us at Leisure World are used to coming in and sitting and hearing presentations and not giving a chance to ask questions to our experts and, we're not, and we don't get a chance to talk to each other about some issues except within our own mutuals. And so what we thought we would do would be to try something that we do at NIH and other uh, professional groups to, bring, to provide a time for you all to talk to each other and to ask questions in smaller groups. And so we're divided into two types of programs today. You will hear from two experts, and we're very happy to have them today to, to talk with you for the first part. We'll take a small break, a physiologic break, when you, and then come back and complete the program. So we, we are really excited about having the two phases and, and for you all to have an opportunity to speak personally with, with the uh, experts that we have today. And so I have the opportunity to introduce the chairs of the, one, the chair of the Emergency Preparedness Advisory Committee, EPAC, and our fearless leader, <laughs> Dr. Uh, du Duchamp. So do go for it. Well, folks, I want, can you hear me now? Oh, here we go. I want to thank all of you for attending this event. It's something that we put together specifically for people in Leisure World. We know we are an aging community, which means we have different needs than others do. So with the combination of the EPAC and the Health Committee, we got together to do this scenario for you folks. Please. Take back the information you received today to your others, because this is something for all residents of this community. We're very interested in helping everybody get prepared for any type of an emergency. I have, I would like to introduce my team, my committee. Uh, I will not give you the names. I just would like the emergency preparedness group to stand up, please. They have their names there. It's much simpler when you see them walk around, you identify them. Thank you very much. And we, we want to have the chair of the health committee, please. You, okay. you take one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, and it has really been a pleasure to work with EPAC uh, for the second year. Uh, this year, and we uh, had a lot of fun. And I'd just like to acknowledge the two members, other members besides myself, of the health committee, uh, Kathy Alano and Mary Wells. If you could stay at wherever you are, 
for the Red Cross of the National Capital Region. Uh, you will, if you look in your program, you will see a short bio. She has quite an interesting background, but I'm not going to, we're a little late, and I'm not going to hold up uh, the discussion, but I would like to let you know that her expertise is in dis disaster response training to professional and community audiences through lecture and hands-on exercises. So she's on the road all the time talking and then delivering the message. So would you help me welcome Candace today? So thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. So you're not going to make me use the mic then? <laughs> OK. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting us back. We are always happy to be out in the community. This is what I love the most the preparedness phase, coming out and talking to people about how to be prepared for emergencies and that D word, disasters, okay? So we do three things in the Red Cross. We do prepare, respond, and recovery. I love the preparedness because we get to talk to you about how to be prepared for emergencies. We also do response. We respond out there in your community. Whenever you hear those fire sirens going in your community, usually Red Cross is not far behind. Because when the firefighters arrive on the scene, they're there to put out fires. They're not there to hold the client's hands and talk to them about recovery. So they call Red Cross, and we're there on the scene. So during our response phase, it's a little bit too late to talk about how you could have prevented that fire, right? So we can't talk about that when we're responding. And then the recovery. We're helping people with long-term recovery. Where do you go from here? Where do you start when you've lost everything? So again, we're in the preparedness phase right now, and this is the best phase to be in, right? So thank you again for having us. We have a short presentation, not too long. We're going to talk about get a kid, make a plan, and be, and, and be prepared, OK? So the biggest thing here is how many of you have been in an emergency here in the National Capital Region? Anyone? Anyone been in an emergency, snowstorm? You had a snowstorm? Have you all experienced that? Power outage, is that a disaster? Yes. For me it is. If my power goes out, that's a disaster. That's an emergency for me. So we want to talk about how to be prepared for emergencies in your area. And we want to talk about get a kit, make a plan, and be prepared. So getting a kit, what, who has a kit? Anyone in here has a kit? You have a kit? Wonderful. I saw a kit. I saw a kit. Where's your kit? Home. <laughs> Home, okay. How about you? Where's your kit? In the closet. I like by the front door closet. I like in the closet. I like that you have a kit. What happens right now? If someone just say, if someone comes in the room right now and say, everyone freeze. Everyone, you have to shelter in place. You can't go anywhere. Are you prepared? No. I am. <laughs> I have my kit. <laughs> and I say that because this is a lot of stuff that you see here, right? People say, wow, look at all this stuff. But this is actually a part of my kits with an S. I have a couple kits, and we're going to talk about that. So when I talk about if you have a kit, that's great that you have one, but it's not limited to one place. You might need a kit in your car. You might need a kit at home. You might need a kit at a family member's house. So you can have more than one. So let's talk about the kit when I say you can have more than one. The red bag that's sitting on the table there, I call this my go bag. Because I do a lot, of t a lot of things out in the community. I'm on a lot of responses out there in the community. So I need a bag that I can grab and go, and it has everything I need. This is my go bag. This bag is my family's go bag. It's a little bit bigger, right? We got a little bit more to carry for a family of four. The reason why I say this is because your type of container, as long as it's portable, durable, and water resistant, doesn't matter what size your kit is, whatever works for you. Because, you know, you take a look at my stuff and say, you say, do you really need that? For me and my family, yes, I need that. Now, your kit, you may decide that this is good enough for your family or for yourself. But again, portable, durable, water resistant. Now, I will tell you, I've seen some people who say, well, I want mine and a footlocker in my house, just in case I have to shelter in place. 
That's fine, but if you have to leave, who's going to carry that footlocker out for you? <laughs> right? So you want to keep that in mind when you're thinking about your kid. So it's possible to have that footlocker in your home for shelter in place, but you can also have a kit that you can move at the ready, right? Someone said that they have their kit by the front door. Who said that? Love it. I do too. This, this suitcase here, in my home, it sits in the foyer as soon as you walk through the front door. And it's there because if we had to escape our home in an emergency, I hope that's the way we can get out, right? That's where we can grab it. Now, I have my teenagers so trained with that is the go bag, the go bag. It's for emergencies. I remember calling home one day and I was telling my 17-year-old son, I said, I forgot my bag. Give me my bag. I'm going to run into a meeting. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And he came running outside with this big suitcase. I meant my purse, okay? <laughs> so, this just goes to tell you how trained I have them about the bag. So I have, to, I have to be specific. The go bag, the emergency bag, or my purse. So anyway, I have the, my kit that sits by the door or by the front door just in case an emergency and the family knows that is the bag. I have my go kit that's inside my vehicle. Wherever I go, it doesn't matter whether it's work or personal, I always have my go kit with me. But I also have a little compact kit. Whether it's in my office, whether I keep extra, I have these smaller ones, just emergency items. So it doesn't matter as long as you're prepared and you have what you need, right? So store that emergency kit by an exit point. So what's in a kit? How many of you have food in your kits? Yes, yay. So, let me ask you, does your food sound like that? <laughs> okay, because the reason why I'm saying this is because with food, you can have whatever type of food you want in your kit. Now you can buy these ready-made meals. This is an emergency ration. Okay, I was in the military for 12 years. My husband's retired military, so I have nothing against a good MRE. I, I don't mind an MRE. This meal, just want to let you know, has about 200 calories in it. It says eat one bar per person every eight hours. Hmm. Why would it say one bar per person every eight hours? The calories, energy. Well, I would tell you. After being in the military, I know that some rations are to keep you regular, okay? <laughs> so I'm just putting this out there that sometimes if you decide to purchase meals ready to eat, you might want to taste it, see if it works for you before you put it in your emergency kit, okay? During the time of an emergency is not the time to figure out this is not working for me, right? So at least try your emergency rations. You can purchase uh, rations that look similar to this. And some of them are really good. They come in really nice packaging. It looks a little bit more, uh, uh, say that again? Appetizing. Yeah, appetizing, yes, exactly. Now I'm gonna show you my go kit that I have every day. Look what I have in my, my go kit for snacks and food. How many of you have seen these before? Little vacuum pack bags of tuna, right? Can't go wrong with this. I don't need anything for that. I also have almonds, cranberries, little snack packs. I also have oatmeal in here. What do we need to eat oatmeal? Water, that's it, right? So some of the items in here, I keep this in my go bag so I can have snacks that I will enjoy. I know I like all of these. So you wanna make sure that when you have food, make sure it's something that everyone will enjoy. If you have special dietary needs, make sure you have that included. If you have kids or grandkids in the home, make sure you don't fill up your snack bag with fruit snacks and all those sugary snacks. The last thing you want is them to have a lot of sugar in a shelter in place and bouncing off the walls, right? So put good stuff in there. The next thing is water. How many of you have an emergency stash of water at home? Yay! So let me ask you a question. Does water expire? Yes. I see yeses. Yes, water expires? Bottle. Or is it the container that expires? It's the container that expires, right? So we recommend, and not only the Red Cross, but in partnership with other organizations to include FEMA, that you have enough water, one gallon per person per day for 72 hours. Those of you who have water, do you have that much water? That's a lot of water, but we are asking that you prepare yourself to be able to take care of yourself in an event of emergency for at least 72 hours. 
And that's 72 hours without calling 911, 411, 211, 311. Yes, those numbers do exist. So without calling any of those numbers, can you take care of yourself for up to 72 hours? And if the answer is no, I don't think so, you're in the right place, okay? So water does expire. Now if you have special dietary needs or medical conditions that say you need more, then you need to stock more. Now yes, the container that the water is in, it does expire. So we don't want you to throw away that water when you're rotating it out because it's expiring. Keep that water because you may need to use that water for perhaps bathing, washing dishes. You never know, right? So you don't have to throw away the water, but you should keep an eye on the expiration dates on that water that you have in your home. Don't forget to rotate it out. Any questions about that? Okay, wonderful. Let's talk about first aid. Any doctors in here? Nurses? Wonderful. Reason why I ask is because with the first aid kits, I get people that ask all the time, what type of first aid kit should I have? Okay, this is a first aid kit. This is a first aid kit. Even this is a first aid kit. We want you to stay within your level of training, okay? <laughs> if you're not a doctor, you're not a nurse, you don't need scalpels in your kit. You don't need all, I mean, doing an emergency is the wrong time to start playing with stuff in your first aid kit, right? So we want you to stay within your level of training with your first aid kit. So again, it can be something as small as this. If you say this is my level of training, <laughs> or it can be something that looks like this. I say the best way to determine what you need in your first aid kit, go in your bathroom. Look, in, look at the items that you usually use. If you have, if you have a cut, what do you usually use for a cut in your own household? Just take a little bit of everything that you already use. Again, you don't want to be experimenting during an emergency, okay? If you have to sit there and say, is this going to work on me? Or do I like, you don't want to do that during an emergency. So when you build your first aid kit, yes, you can get the ready-made kit, or you can just go ahead and start in your own home and build your first aid kit. Remember, stay within your level of training. How many of you are CPR qualified? Hands only CPR. So do you have your resuscitation mask or breathing barrier inside your first aid kit? You want to include these as well. You want to include anything that you're using on a daily basis inside that first aid kit. How many of you have medications in your, in your go bag, in your emergency kit? Emergency, emergency. If you lose everything, if you are not home or you have to leave your home and you need your medications, you know the little brochure that comes with all your prescriptions? What if you took those brochures and all you did was drop it inside your emergency kit? So just in case there's an emergency, you know your prescriptions. Now I would tell you the hardest thing for me is when I'm on a responding to a disaster and emergency and we have health services there to help clients who need their medications or they need uh, medical equipment replaced. And I just gotta love the person who says, yes, I need my medication. It's a little white pill about this big, and I need it every day. Even with the best of, of the best doctors on the scene, we can't help with the little white pill, okay? We need to know what it is, what is the strength, what is the name of it, so we can help you get it filled quickly. So the best way to do that is to keep even the, the small bottles, once they're empty, you can put a bottle inside your, inside your emergency kit. Or you can ask for a three-month supply and have it on hand at all times. So make sure that you at least have a list of those prescriptions or at least a name of all those prescriptions so at least you'll be able to be serviced if something should happen. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. They can also put their prescription list on their iPhone for that. Absolutely. I love it. He said you can put it on your iPhones. Yeah. How many going to put it on their iPhones? <laughs> so you can put it on your iPhone, your Android, whatever works for you. I tell you, everything. I have on my iPad. The iPad is like an extension of my arm. It's never too far. It's on the podium right now. So you, wherever you can get to it in a hurry, if you need to, at least have it somewhere um, handy. Let's talk about the next one, clothing and bedding. Now I'm waiting for someone to say, okay, you say I need this, this, and that. You say I need all this water, and now I need clothing. And it's all going to fit in the go bag, right? <laughs> so clothing. I would tell you, I was at an uh, 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 organization asked us to do a presentation for them, and so we asked everyone to bring in your go bags, your emergency kits. We told them, bring them into the presentation. We want to see what you have. 
So I remember one guy, he brought in his emergency kit. Actually, it was a lady. And we asked for clothing. And I asked him, who has clothing? And she says, I do, I do. And she pulled out her clothing, and it was mismatched. It was a shirt and a bottom that obviously didn't go together. And I was asking, okay. And she said, well, I didn't want to put my good clothes in my emergency kit. So let me ask you, if you're in an emergency situation, you have nothing but the clothes in your go bag or your emergency kit, would you want them to match? Would you want to look like you're okay? So here's my point. If you, when you make your go bag, yes, put clothing in there, but put something in there that you'll be comfortable wearing if that's all you had. So I always recommend a, a sweatshop, sweatshirt, sweatpants perhaps, whatever makes you comfortable. When I'm talking about a family of four, I just want it to match, you know, pants, shirt, socks, some shoes. Keep in mind the weather. If it's summertime, you don't need to have gloves and a hat in there, correct? So in the summertime, wintertime, you're going to have to rotate out those clothes, but at least you'll have something in there, whatever makes you comfortable. When we're talking about that clothing and bedding, inside my go bag, I have a blanket in there, amongst other things in there, but I have this blanket because I know me. I like to sleep with something up under my head, under my neck. So if clothing and, and, and uh, blankets or anything that you say is a necessity for you, make sure it's in your go bag. If you were to go to a Red Cross shelter, most likely you will not have a pillow, okay? We don't have pillows all the time in our shelters. How many of you need a pillow when you're sleeping? If you know you need one, go ahead and pack one of those in your go bag in your kit. Now everything that I'm saying when I say go bag, when I say emergency kit, keep in mind that all these are items that you can have when sheltering in, the, in place as well, okay? It's not just to go. If you have this stuff already prepared in your home for shelter in place, that's great too. Let's talk about tools and emergency supplies. How many of you have flashlights? Woohoo! Batteries that work? Maybe. <laughs> because here's my experience with flashlights. I have them, have a lot of them. Batteries, they'll be brand new in the pack, and then when I need it, I go to put it in there and it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Because they expired. Exactly. So that happens all the time. Not only do they expire, sometimes the bulb goes out of it, right? So I've learned that I'm not too good with rotating out batteries with flashlights. It's hard to say when they're going to run out. But I will tell you, I love, love, love my life light. Who said life light? You remember that? Yay! So this is a life light. Now what's cool about a life light is that I can crank this. I don't need batteries for this light because all I do is crank it and it's a flashlight. Now, if I'm in an emergency, I'm on the other side of the road, it's also a beacon light, okay? Now again, this beacon light slash flashlight, I just charge it by cranking it. I can charge it for about 15 minutes and I'm gonna get at least three to four hours. I'm just really all over the place, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this life light, you just crank this for about 15 minutes. The other neat thing about this is on the other end of this, this is a windshield breaker. How many of you have ever had to break your windshield for any reason? I haven't either, but I'm ready. Um, on the other end of this is a seat belt cutter. Anyone ever had to cut a seat belt before? I haven't either, but seat belts last a, last a lifetime. <laughs> Cars can go 20, 30 years in those seat belts without even being changed out, right? So this is an emergency flashlight as well as window breaker. What about this on the other end? Gotta love this. Can you all see that? It's a cell phone charger. You can charge your cell phone, iPhone, Android just by cranking it. And sometimes all you need is about five minutes, right? On that cell phone, if I just had five more minutes on that cell phone battery, right? This light, I give these almost every year now for Christmas gifts because no one ever has one. This is one of those gifts that keeps on giving. It's a lot of good stuff on here. On the other end of it, I even have a compass. So a lot of good stuff with this. Now I will tell you, we don't sell this with the Red Cross, but everything you see on this table, you can purchase this almost anywhere. 
We would love for you to purchase it from redcrossstore.org, but you don't have to. You can go to Amazon or Walmart or somewhere else to purchase these items. We just want you to be ready, okay? And it doesn't matter where you get it from, and um, as long as you have it and you're ready to go. Now, I'm going to pass this around. Oh, I knew you'd ask, Lewis. Here you are. This is what it's called. It's called Life Light, and this is the package for it. So I'll pass this around so you all can take a look at it. Like I said, it's up to you whether this is for you or not. How many of you have weather radios? Those of you who have kits. Yes, yes, I like that. Weather radios are awesome because, one, I'm a news fanatic. I like to know what's going on, okay? I like to go with, know what's going on, and sometimes you won't always get it on one place, that television or online. But your weather radio, again, all you have to do is crank this weather radio. You get all the AM, FM channels. Not only that, on the other end, there's a flashlight on this as well. And you know that neat little charger for your phones? Right here on the other end as well. So this, you can either crank this or it's solar powered right here in this panel. So this weather radio, you can get this in three different, in a lot of different ways. This is a weather radio. Same thing as the other one, just a larger model. More outlets on the back of it to charge more devices. You also have the solar panel as well. You can also even plug this in and the wall and charge it. Or you can put batteries in here. A lot of different choices with this. And I see them over there on the table. And they look like uh, door prizes there. So someone might be lucky today. Yes, sir. Um, I've never used, I have one of those kind of radios since our last presentation. Mm -hmm. um, is it recommended um, to, I keep it near the window so it'll be charged at all times. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. I love that. He said he keeps this near the window because this is solar. So that's wonderful. That's a great idea. What about this? What's this on the other end of it? Thank you. See, I knew you all know, but let me tell you. We go into the elementary schools and we're talking to children. And I love to say, so what's this? What do you think they say? Pointer. It's a pointer. It's a saber. It's a, it's a sword. They haven't said that yet. <laughs> so the kids, they have a feel with this. They don't see antennas every day, okay? But yes, it's, a, it's an antenna here. So we're, you can find these just about anywhere. Again, we have these on our Red Cross store site. You can buy it there. You can buy this in Walmart, Amazon, just about any sport and goods store. You can find these weather radios. And I'll pass that around as well. So I love weather radios. Even this model, same thing, works the same way, has a flashlight on the end. It's just what works for you. And I have a couple of these because I keep one in my go bag. I keep one in, my, in the big kit that I have for the family. So you can pass these back and take a look at those. And they range in prices as well. Again, go with what works for you. What about this? What's this? Anyone? Swiss Army knife. knife. Yeah, all purpose knife. All types of little gadgets on here, right? Now, I will be the first to tell you, I don't know how to use half of this stuff on here. But um, I like to think I'm ready, just in case. Or if I'm in an emergency, somebody will know how to use something on here, right? Yeah. So between a can opener, a screwdriver, everything on this little knife. This little multi-purpose tool just folds right up, has a little carrying case, about $10 for this. But this is something that I have to have in my emergency bag because you never know. Now I tell you, sometimes I have a hard audience, depending on who I'm doing this presentation with, so I have to switch it up. How many of you have seen this one before? Same thing, but those who have a, uh, some skills here, on the other end of this, what is this? There's a little hatchet and a hammer, okay? <laughs> so we got a lot of little tricks over here, and I will tell you, this is an axe on the end. It is sharp. So please, no one take the cover off and say, oh, it is sharp. I cut myself. <laughs> Trust me on this one. It's sharp. It's a little hammer. But it's a multi-purpose tool, something that I keep in my emergency kit, a lot of different tools on here, and something in case of emergency. I'll pass this around as well. So any questions so far? So what about this orange thing up there? What is this? 
emergency um, window breaker. Yes, an emergency window breaker. Now, how many of you live in homes that have uh, sliding glass doors? Sliding glass doors. Perhaps you're on a high level floor. Anyone on a high level floor? What if you had an emergency and you're up on a high level and you can't get out through your front door and you have to wave out the window, help, help, help. Do you think this window breaker would help if you're in somewhere where you can't get out and you just want to wave down, someone help? You think that will work for you? It should, absolutely. Now I will tell you, this is a windshield breaker, a glass breaker. It can, it can shatter your sliding glass door, a window. Now please don't purchase this and then send me an email and say it really works. <laughs> and they're done that. It works, folks. Don't try it. It works, okay? This little tool right here, and this is about five or seven dollars. They sell them just about everywhere, but if you don't know what you don't know, <laughs> you've probably walked past it a dozen times. But I highly recommend having one of these if you don't have one in your emergency kit. The reason why it has a mount on the back is because it can be mounted in your car for an emergency. Instead of putting it in the glove compartment or putting it in the trunk, you can actually mount it closer to uh, the front of the vehicle. I'll pass that back to you. So the next one is tape. How many of you have tape in your emergency kit? Tape? Oh, wow. Let me talk to you about tape. I love tape, okay? Tape. Tape. You can just keep looking through that, Jay. So the tape can do just about everything. You see repair ropes, make repair booths, make a rope, repair your water bottle, tape a broken window that you, that you shattered on accident. <laughs> so there's all types of tape, and I say all types of tape because you never know what you need until you need it, right? So I have tape, masking tape, I have clear packaging tape, I have electrical tape, I even have painter's tape, okay? So tape is your friend during an emergency. Don't underestimate the value of tape because again, you don't know what you need until you need it. But you can see up there all the different things you can do with it. Repair clothing, wrap a sprained ankle, make a belt. I mean, so many different things you can do with tape. Tape is your friend. And um, I have to say, my husband of almost 25 years, he is not mechanically inclined, okay? So tape is his friend. He's allowed to use tape in emergencies as much as he likes, just as long as he doesn't pull it out, you know, to fix something at home. Go to the next one, please. So what I like to tell people, if, it's, if your tape's not working, it's because you're not using enough of it, okay? So tape is your friend. <laughs> so let's talk about that square thing in the middle. What is that square thing in the middle? It's a map. It's a map. Nothing, nothing complex about it. How many of you have one of these in your emergency kit? <laughs> I heard that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it. It's a map, right? Now we say, okay, it's a map. What's the big deal, right? Me personally, I use my GPS. I use it when I'm about 10 minutes away from home. It's not that I don't know where my home is at. It's that I use the GPS because it tells me about the traffic. It lets me know if I need to take a shortcut. But here's the thing. What if that cell phone, your battery dies on your cell phone and you're about an hour away from home or during emergencies when the cell phones do not work? Those of you who love GPS, what's your plan? The alternative, right? So these maps, I love maps. I keep one of Prince George's County and it's well used. <laughs> and I have one here of Montgomery County as well, a newer one. So I keep these maps in my vehicle at all times because you never know when you're going to have to pull out a map. And I will tell you, most people do not have maps. They do sell them, by the way. You can still purchase them. So I would highly advise to get a map. And I know that sometimes we're out there um, directing uh, traffic. Maybe there's a, a response going on and people have to go another route. And I'll never forget the lady. We were telling her that they were standing water that we didn't want them to ride, drive through, right through the water, and plus there was an emergency going on. And I kept telling her she couldn't come through, and I remember her saying, I've lived here for 30 years, this is the only way I know how to get home. And she was really upset, really, really upset. So, there's a problem. If you lived there for 30 years and you only know one way home, right? That might be a problem. So you want to consider alternate routes. When we talk about have a plan, we're talking about, in case of emergency, know another route to get home. Make sure you have a map, because have you ever been so near but so far away from somewhere where you're trying to get to? 
Um, I love to tell folks that when, when we came here to the National Capital Region, um, I had a very challenging time because here in this region, in this area, you have I-95, 195, 295, help me out folks, 395, 495, 695, right? So you can only imagine when I moved here to this area with I-95, 395, 295, I got lost so many times, it was ridiculous. And I remember very clearly the last time I got lost. And I remember it because I remember calling my husband and I told my husband, I'm on the corner of such and such and such and such. And he said, oh good, I can tell you how to get home. And guess what I told him? I'm past that. We're beyond that. Come and get me. So he had, he had to drive to where I was at and I followed him home. That's how frustrated I was. So with that said, you need maps. Do not rely on your GPS. You need some alternatives here. Next slide. Specialty items. How many of you have money in your emergency kit, like cash? If you don't, you should. Because sometimes, like we said before, the power will be out. You probably can't use that ATM or your credit or debit card somewhere. You need to have cash, small bills preferably. For example, have you ever gone to the grocery store and shopped for about 45 minutes and you go in the checkout line and they say, cash only, right? Imagine during an emergency. We've been on a lot of deployments all over the country and there are times when you will not have access to your cash. You may have a lot of cash, but if you don't have access to it, access to it from a bank or somewhere like that, you're going to be stuck. So we highly recommend that you have cash on hand. Now I will tell you, that is one item that I do not have in my emergency kits. I have teenagers. Any cash is on hand, they think it's for them. Even if I hide it, well I thought it was for me in case of an emergency. So I don't have cash on hand where they know where it's at, but you need to have that in your emergency kit. How about important documents or paper? Where do you keep those? Important documents. In a safe? In a home safe? Anyone else? Safe deposit box. Anyone else? In a drawer. In a drawer? Okay, so let me ask the question. If there was an emergency, if you had to get out in a hurry, are you going to go look for that emergency in that emergency drawer to get your emergency paperwork? Are you going back for your safe? Or are you gonna get out in a hurry? You're gonna get out in a hurry, right? So if you're gonna get out in a hurry, what's an alternative to in a safe, in a drawer, in the home? What are some other options? Yes, ma'am. Make a copy of everything. Oh, nice. Make a copy of everything and where put your copy? Where are you going to put your copy? In your kit. In your kit. Yay. Anyone else? What else would you do with those documents? I heard this gentleman say in a safe deposit box. Love it. Only thing we say about a safe deposit box, just don't do it a block away from your home, okay? <laughs> because if your community is affected, your home's affected, it might be everywhere. It might be within a certain square mile radius. So you want to take it a little bit further from your home. You also want to have that personal support network. If you have someone that you can give a copy of all that paperwork to, that would be wonderful. Another alternative that I like is storing it in the cloud, saving everything. Every document that I have, I scan all of it, birth certificates, marriage, everything. I scan all those documents and I save it to the cloud. Now that's an alternative. Some people say, well, you know, it's not safe in the cloud. I don't want to use technology. If you don't want to save it, if you, if you, if you're uncomfortable with saving it to the cloud, you can pay for a, a, an encrypted service. It's about a dollar or two a month, okay, for that encrypted service to have all your documents just to click away. So it's up to you, but just don't put it in one place. I remember being on a deployment in Oklahoma, and there's a picture. Um, I'm standing there with the client, and we're looking this way, and, and folks always ask me, well, what are you all looking at? Because it looked like we're just looking off into the horizon. What we were looking at, was the foundation of his home. Tornado came and took everything. The house was gone. There was nothing but the foundation. Guess where all his important paperwork was? In the safe, in the home, that was gone. No clue where that safe went to. So again, do not rely on, all, on everything to be in one location. You may need to make copies and put it in other places as well. How many of you have pets? 
Yes, yes. If you had an emergency today, do you have a kit for your pet? Yes, you need a kit for your pet. And um, we've been on a lot of emergencies where people don't want to leave their pets. They will not leave their dog, their cat, their iguana last week, <laughs> so, and birds. So you need to make sure that you have a kit for your pet. Make sure you have water for your pet, food for your pet, as well as a leash. I can't tell you how many emergencies we've seen where someone's holding a dog and they have a big dog at that and they're sitting there holding a big dog while all this activity is going on around them because they didn't have a leash for the dog, okay? And they, the crates, tape. crates, they can be collapsed. Tape. Tape, yes, that's tape. right, thank you, Lewis. A tape for your leash, you can make one. A photo of you and your pet. Really important to have a photo of you and your pet because sometimes pets, they get away from us or perhaps someone will find them during an emergency and all of a sudden this beautiful cute little doggy, now it's called Coco and it's mine and, and they rename it. But if you have a picture of you and your pet, that helps for identification purposes during emergencies. So a picture in your kit of your pet is wonderful as well as medication and vet records. You want to have that because during most emergencies, Red Cross or other agencies can provide assistance with sheltering your pet. But we need to see those vet records as well, okay? So make sure if, you, if your pet means that much to you, make a kit and be prepared for them as well. Something else I wanted to share with you on here, hang on just a second, are these. How many of you have seen Blackout Buddies before? I love Blackout Buddies. Blackout Buddy, these are flashlights. You plug this into the outlets in your home, and during, when you turn off the lights, they become night lights. They're on your walls. Now, if you had an emergency and you need a flashlight, this comes right out of the wall, and now it's a flashlight already charged. How nice is that? So I'll pass that around so you can take a look at that. And these are the Blackout Buddy H2Os. These little flashlights, they can go right in a purse, a pocket. These flashlights only take one ounce of water for 72 hours of light. How cool is that? Those of you with the kit, do you have a Blackout Buddy H2O? <laughs> this is nice. You can be prepared anywhere with this. 72 hours off of a little couple ounces of, uh, ounce of water in there. That's something to consider. <clears throat> now in this go bag, remember I showed you my blanket in here? How many of you have a blanket inside your go bag? Yay, you do? Is it a nice, fleece, comfortable, my blanket kind of thing? That'll work. That'll work too. And the reason, the reason why I mentioned that is because I love these. These are all emergency blankets. Have you seen these before? These are emergency blankets. This emergency blanket, this is great in the car. It can even fit in your purse. These, these blankets are thermal, meaning that it holds in the body heat. Now, someone told me at once one presentation, he said, oh, I can make that. That's just aluminum foil. It's a little bit of a difference, okay, folks? So I see this lady over here. She's all bundled up in her sweater, and I'm going to give it to her. So, <laughs> now, it's a little loud, <laughs> that particular one, but I want her to just put that around her shoulders because um, it's thermal. It's going to hold in her body heat, and that's what you need in inclement weather, something that's going to hold in that body heat, and it really works okay that's something that you could put in an emergency kit you also have this an emergency blanket not as loud as that one the material is a little bit different but this is for an emergency for a blanket how many of you are always cold <laughs> you know I have a twin sister she's always cold and she lives in Florida okay so this emergency blanket you can have these in an emergency kit this is an emergency blanket I like this one this is a bivy I have one of these for each person in my family. It's four of us. We have four bivvies in our emergency kit. You can actually get inside of this and zip this up. This is emergency. I'll pass these around. Where available? You can get it from anywhere. You can get it from Walmart, again, Amazon, any sport and goods store. It just depends on what you want and what works for you. Again, if you have to shelter in place, sometimes the power goes out, power outages. House can get really cold really fast, right? Those emergency, the emergency bivy, the emergency blankets, those are something that you can use as well. How many of you have seen these, seen these before? Hot hand warmers. 
Don't you love them? Oh my goodness, these are your friend. They come for boots too, but these hot hand warmers, all you do is open up the packet, shake it up a little bit, and you can stick it inside your gloves, you can stick it inside your boots, whatever works for you. But these, these two, in the emergency kit. I'll pass those around as well. Um, do you have anything if you want to keep cool? If you want to keep cool. An air-conditioned blanket? <laughs> I wish I would have one of those. I haven't seen one yet, Louis, but next year I'll have one. I'll find one for us. <laughs> so I'm showing you these because these are dis different options that you have. Go back one slide, the reason why I'm showing this because when we're talking about specialty items, tools, it's up to you what you want to go in your bag, whatever works for you. I find these items, like I said, this is really my kit, or part of my kits with the S. I have these items because when I see them, I say, okay, I would probably need that in an emergency, or I would probably need that for someone in my family in an emergency. So use what works for you. Next slide, too. Make a plan. I like talking about a plan. If right now, if something happened right now and you had to shelter in place and there's someone else in your home, a loved one or family member, do they know what the plan is if there's an emergency? How they would contact you or what they would do? Do they know? Do you know? And the reason why I ask this is because a lot of people, they do not have a plan if something should happen. I'll give you an example. How many of you have contact cards? Emergency contact cards. I ask this because, when, like I said, when we go into the schools, if I ask some of the kids nowadays, what's your phone number? You know what they do? They go straight to their cell phone and they start looking for numbers in their cell phones. They have cell phones better than we do, okay? <laughs> they start looking in their cell phones because they don't all know their phone numbers anymore. And here's the thing. We rely on our cell phones so much, I have over 200 contacts in my phone and I don't think I know any of them by heart, except for my immediate family members. If you don't know all those numbers, how many of you still keep an address book? You know the little thing that we used to put phone numbers, names, and addresses? <laughs> Anyone still have an address book? A lot? There we go. We're in the right group. <laughs> you all know what a map is. You know what an address book is. You can only imagine the different groups we have. So the address books, we highly encourage you to keep up with the address books, especially with your own pet personal network, contact cards. Children used to have contact cards on the back of their backpacks when they went to school, right? But then we said stranger safety, and everyone doesn't have contact numbers on the outside of their bags anymore. But we encourage you to keep those manual lists of contact numbers, whether it's an address book or contact card. We have some back there in the back that look similar to this one. So you can start filling those out if you don't have them already. You need to know where to go and what to do in case of emergency. Shelter in place. That's an option. That's, that's something that could happen here in Leisure World, correct? Yeah. So sheltering in place. You want to make sure that if you have to shelter in place for whatever reason, make sure that you're gonna, you know how to or you can close and lock all the exterior and interior doors and windows. That's definitely, if they say shelter in place because of something environmental or something else that's going on, you need to know how to do those. Turn off all your pans and your cooling systems because we know air comes through there. Um, we just had an incident in College Park about two nights ago. Did everyone see that big fire that they were fighting? That, that was a long one. Uh, I think they would started trying to put that fire about 9 a.m. and they were still working on about 9 p.m. And to the next day, that was a huge one. But we had a lot of apartments around there and people were evacuating from the apartment because they had windows open and vents open and so they had to close them all to keep that fresh air in their units. We want you to go to a small interior, gather your disaster kit, because you already have one, right? And your family and pets. Go to a small interior, um, above ground room of your house. Um, that's really important because if you're living in an apartment building or a multifamily building, you probably won't have that option. But that option, when we start talking about a small interior, may mean your bathroom. It may mean going into the bathroom and shutting that door. You want to seal vents, cracks, and windows. How would you seal windows, cracks, and windows? Yes, 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 with our tape that's in your emergency kit, right? And they come in all colors, too. Listen to your communication device. Hmm, what would that be? Your weather radio, right? So you have that in your kit. And then also, too, uh, for life-threatening emergencies, call 911. Everyone knows to call 911, right? So here, there's a diagram there of, a, of an emergency uh, escape plans. 
This is what we advise. Whenever you go into a room, you should always look for two ways out of that room. Doesn't matter what size of room it is, you, doesn't matter where you're at, you always want to know two ways to escape a room. I know when I go into places, I always look for two places. Maybe it's the Red Cross in me, but I'm always looking. I remember a few months ago, I was at a friend's house and they were having a party in the basement. There are about 30 or 40 people down there. There was only one way out, and that was up the narrow stairs that everyone went down. Beautiful basement, large basement, but there was one way out. I had an emergency. I just remember I had somewhere to be, so, and I left. And I'm just telling you, you want to look at two ways out of every situation, every room that you're in. You want to consider that. You also want to think about workplace and school. If you have certain places that you go into the community all the time, do you have a second way you can get there or get back home? Do you have a plan for that? Turn off utilities. Because you're probably in this, uh, this, com this type of community, you probably won't be responsible for turning off um, uh, utilities. But this is a device that's used to shut off your water and your gas. These come in really handy. And I will tell you, during the Silver Spring explosion, Everyone remember the Silver Spring explosion last August? And that was gas, right? There was an explosion. There were people who were calling us saying that they did not want to go back home because they were afraid to go back home because they didn't know whether, you know, their building, something would happen there. There were some um, family, uh, single family homeowners. They wanted to ch shut off their utilities. They could have shut it off themselves had they had this tool. They had this tool and they knew how. They could have shut off their own utilities and sheltered in place. So. Those types of items, again, you may or may not need it in your kit, but to have that on hand would have been very helpful for that situation as well. A meeting location. For my family, my teenagers know that in case of an emergency, they're to get out and stay out and go to Miss Tammy's house. Miss Tammy is a neighbor three doors down. In case of emergency, they're not there. Guess where I'm looking first? Miss Tammy's house. So you need to have a plan. Doesn't matter what that plan is, but make sure you have one and that's communicated to your network. Next slide. Your pets, just like we said before, make sure you have a, a kit for your pets, have a place for them to go. Pet notification stickers. How many of you have pet notification stickers? If you had to leave in an emergency and perhaps something happened and you were away from home, if you have this sticker in your window, when first responders and other people come through the community, they'll see that sticker in the window of your home and know that you have a pet and they'll know that they'll have to help that get that pet out of there. Next one. Safe and well. Safe and well is a site that you can go and register. Say there's an evacuation going on or something going on in your community, you can register on Safe and Well where you can actually send messages to loved ones, tell them I'm okay. Perhaps you don't have phone or you don't have technology. Safe and well is a good site to go to. Make a plan again. Remember to share it. <laughs> Next part. Make, make sure that you practice. Practice your drills. How many minutes do you have to get out of a house or a building that's burning? Anyone, how many minutes? Seven. Seven. I heard seven. Anyone else? Two. two minutes, folks. It used to be seven years ago. It's down to two minutes now. Why is it only two minutes to get out of a burning home, a burning house, a burning apartment? It doesn't matter. Why? Anyone? There's a lot more flammable stuff in the house. Exactly. More flammable stuff in the house, the smoke. Those toxic fumes, when we see smoke on television, it's hazy, <laughs> right? But real smoke, it's thick, it's black. You can't see your hand in front of your face, okay? Keep going. Um, and then online at ARC, BR, B Red Cross Ready, the initials there, you can make your own plan. If you say this was just way too much, you can actually go on our website and build a plan, even build a kit. That's fine. Be informed. We said this before. Get info. You can get that. Next one. You can get that from your radio, TV, uh, internet. Know how to get the information you need. There's a lot of websites, a lot of information. We have a flyer back there that says um, Be Red Cross Ready, and it has all this information that we've covered today. It's on the back table. There's also some apps. If you like apps, there's apps for just about everything, and they're all free. You can download these apps, first aid, pet safety, everything. In our region, what we respond to almost every single day are fires house fires. We respond to all emergencies, disasters, but that's the biggest one. Single family fires and multi-family fires. Be informed. Get trained. We, we say with CPR that even if you don't know how to do feel, full CPR, you can at least do hands-only CPR. Something is better than nothing. Now it's your, thir your turn. What's one thing after this presentation today that you're going to do differently? What would that be? Anyone? 
Make a bag. Make a bag. Get a kit, right? Anyone else? Yes, sir. What would you do? I see him back here. He must be talking to his neighbor there. Okay, so we hope that after today, if you don't have a kit, that you'll make a kit. And if you already have a kit, that you'll just add a little something to it, something that you may need. So if you don't have any more questions for me, thank you for coming to the presentation today. We really appreciate it. I'm Sandra McCluskey. I'm chair of the Health Advisory Committee. And it's my privilege to introduce Darlene Brownlee, who's going to give the second half of our presentation. Her uh, bio is on the second page of your program. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that, but I am going to say that when I came to Leisure World, the medical center did not have a nurse practitioner giving primary care. And I said, oh, the medical center should have a nurse practitioner. And they said, oh no, the Leisure World residents would never accept a nurse practitioner. And I believe she is the most popular primary care provider there. <laughs> so just goes to show. And she's going to be assisted by Dion Hawkins, who is our newest director or new director of the physical therapy part of the medical center, which is on the second floor. And it says here that she helps residents maintain mobility and recover from injuries. And I can tell you that that's really true because I threw my back out and she helped me get over it. <laughs> so there you go. And so we Without further ado, I'll just hand the mic over to Darlene. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's so good to see you guys on the other side of the <laughs> office. So thank you very much. It's really appreciated. I'm honored. So I am a professor, so I'm going to, we're, we're, going, we're going to school. I'm a professor, okay? So we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation. It's going to be interactive, okay? So these are the goals for today. I'm not going to read them, but the bottom line is we're going to talk about why you fall, how you fall, when, where, and why. Again, why, why, how, when, and where. Okay? Okay, so let's do a little presentation. Okay? It's talking to my sweet. Okay, we'll do it. I'll try my best. Okay? Yeah. So, this little presentation we have here, help, I fall and I can't get up, that's comical to me. Because typically when we fall, right? You guys fall, and Dion's going to tell me what to do. So first of all, who has fallen? Show hands. <laughs> who was scared to death when they fell? <laughs> do some of you know what you should do after you fall? Stay there. <laughs> okay, we have to stay there. Anybody else? What should you do if you fall? Don't move. Don't move. Yeah, don't let anybody lift you. Okay. So these are all good things. One of the things that we would teach somebody who's had a fall when they come to physical therapy is how you can get up. But sometimes even that doesn't work. Sometimes you're so scared of the fact that I can't get up, you can't even remember the good things to do. So, oh no, Miss Darlene is falling. <laughs> can't get up. So, the first thing you need to do is just breathe. Just breathe, okay? I had a patient who recently told me, I know what to do. But I was so paralyzed by the fact that I couldn't get up. You have to just stop and breathe. The first thing you want to try to do is try to roll over. So you can do that by first moving your arm and then crossing your legs one over the other to roll your body over. Okay? That's the first thing you would do. Now that you're on your belly, try to come onto your hands and knees. Oh, that's good. Tough. <laughs> and it is tough for some. It, it may be painful, but versus being on the floor all by yourself for who knows how long, it's worth it to try. Okay? What happens mm -hmm. when you don't have knees? Yeah. <laughs> what happens when you don't have knees? <laughs> okay. Go ahead and just try to push up on your knees. I want you to try to get your bottom up and slowly move the booty. I like that. Move the booty. And push up and just, if you just scoot one side to the other. One side to the other and try to get your knees up underneath you. Go ahead and come on up. Push, push through your elbows and push through your hands. Oh, she did it. And there you go. Now if you can get to this position, look around. 
Is there a bed? Is there a chair? Is there something else that you can crawl to to help you get up from this position? It's much easier if you have some other type of support to help get yourself up onto. First, get your hands up. Then get your elbows up. If you have something else to pull up onto, do so. One knee at a time. And then push up with your hands. <coughs> yes, ma'am. However, if you have fallen and have really hurt yourself, and this, right. and this is true. And you can't. This, do and, it. and you're absolutely right. There are some situations, and Ms. Darlene is going to show you what she said is true. This looks comical. Can we go to the next slide? This is what actually happens when you fall. Sometimes. You fall, you guys. Oh you guys look like this here. These are real pictures after people have fallen. So when you guys come and see me, or your doctor, we're looking at you like this here. This is a reality of how people look when they fall. Okay? Again, reality of how people look. This is just when, again, if you fall on your side, you have a contusion on your side with maybe a laceration. Real pictures, guys. When you have a broken arm or you fall on your arm, of course, as you mentioned, you can't get up, okay, because your arm is swollen and it may, may be broken. Real pictures. If you fall on, and on your face, you're going to have a black eye, okay. These are all a bloody eye and it's swollen and red. So we're going to talk about a case study, okay. A lot of you guys come in. And this is exactly what happens. We have a Mr. Reynolds, is an 82-year-old retired United States Postal Service worker. His wife has mild dementia and is a primary caregiver. They have three children, all living out of state. The daughter, Susie, travels monthly conducting spot checks. On one monthly visit with her parents, she noticed that he has a black eye and bruising on his left hand. He finally admits that he failed last week, but, it wasn't, but wasn't really injured and otherwise says, I have very little to complain about, I'm just getting older. Susie has tried for several months to encourage her parents to relocate to where she lives, but both are very reluctant to give up their house and independence. She also feels that he would benefit from additional help, but he refuses saying that he is fine. Susie insists that he sees his primary provider, and he finally agrees after much pers persuasion. Mr. Reynolds has a history of hypertension, congestive heart failure, diabetes, osteoarthritis, and dizziness. His medication consists of losartan, hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams daily for hypertension, metoprolol, 25 milligrams for congestive heart failure, metformin, 500 milligrams for diabetes, and tramadol, 100 as needed for arthritis, and meclizine, 12.5 for dizziness. A lot of medications, right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. The home care nurse was designated to do the initial visit to Mr. Reynolds' house. Susie was in attendance during the assessment. She reviewed with the nurse her dad's recent falling and him minimizing the injuries that he received. She also stated that Mr. Reynolds started showing signs of increased forgetfulness. She feels that his memory is now worsening. She says that he complains of pain in his knees and back and does not sleep well. Susie is also worried that he has fallen three times in the last two days, two weeks, and has not left the home, not left the house in the last month. So now what? This sounds familiar? You guys fall and you can't get up? Okay. Now what? So what are you expecting when you come to the doctor's office to see a nurse practitioner or your doctor? What are you expecting? Anyone? My doctor. Okay, look at your medication, good answer. Anybody else? Report the incident. Report the incident to who? To the doctor. Okay, anybody else? Or nurse. Okay, yes? Social worker involved. Social worker involved. We have three great answers. Anybody else? X-rays. X-rays, okay, great. So what is a fall? Not being elementary, but people don't know what a fall is. If you're coming from a high plane to a low plane, you have fallen. Tripping results with falling. Stumbling is a fall. Okay? So keep in mind, not that you always just you just fall like I just did there, but if you're tripping or stumbling, slipping, that is considered a fall. High plane to a low plane. The question is, have you fallen in the last past year? Anybody fallen in the last year? Okay? Were you hurt? 
Did you seek emergency care? Anybody? Okay. Do you worry about falling? Because you fell once, are you fearful of falling? Anybody? Okay. Do you feel unsteady when standing or, or falling? When it's just walking, do you feel unsteady? Anybody? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. And did you report your fall? How many people reported their fall? That is, did you report the fall to the emergency people, to your doctor, to your nurse practitioner? <coughs> to your doctor. To your doctor. So you did. How many people sought emergency care, went to the emergency room? Okay, all right. So, the lady says, I haven't told anyone that I failed because I may lose my independence. And the guy says, don't worry, I fall too. But after my fall, I had a checkup to make sure I was well, my medications were changed, and I was given advice on how to make my home safer. I was given information about suitable exercise classes. Okay. In Leisure World, last year, they had 83 falls, which I found very hard to believe. I think it's more, because people are not reporting it. We see more at our clinic. That's just on the trust properties. Okay, so just on the, thank you. Just on the trust properties, 83 falls. And I think we all can agree there's a lot more than 83 falls. Okay. So facts, each year, millions of older people, those 65 and older, fall. In fact, more than one out of four older people fall each year, but less than half tell their provider. Okay? Falling once doubles your chance of falling again. So prevalence, according to the CDC, one-fourth of Americans aged 65 and older fall each year. Every 11 seconds, an adult falls, Okay, the treat in the emergency room for a fall. Every 19 minutes, an older adult dies from the fall. So I'm here because of the seriousness of falling. Falls are the leading cause of fatal injury and the most common cause of non-fatal trauma-related hospital admissions among older adults. Okay, fall is more than 2.8 million injuries in the emergency room. Period. 800,000 hospitalizations and 27,000 deaths. Okay, 2,500, 2,550, 100 are admitted with hip fractures. Look at the cost. The cost of injuries from falls is 34 billion. Okay, and the financial toll for adult death falls is increasing. As people get older, it's going to continue to go up. Right now, they say by 2020, it's going to be 67.7 billion dollars. So fall has a large impact on the community. How come it said earlier, uh, if you fall down once, you're likely to fall? Twice as likely to fall as another time. Because people have fear of falling, and it all depends on if they're deconditioned, it depends on their um, condition, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes? The person had osteoporosis. Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. Yes. Okay. So again, of those who fall, 20 to 30 percent suffer moderate to severe injuries that reduce mobility, independence, and increase the risk of premature death. The fatality is higher in men than women in each age category. And why do you think that is? They're heavier. They're heavier, but what, what other reasons? They're taller. Taller. What other reasons? Why is it? Yes. Men are unlikely not to comply. Okay, but what other reason is there? Are they more risky? They have more risky behaviors? Climbing ladders, maybe? Okay. So they have more risky behaviors? Okay. After age 75, the fatality rates are highest among white men, followed by white women, black men, and black women. 10 to 20 percent of all falls cause serious injuries, such as head trauma, and then fractures are among the most prevalent fall injuries. The most serious debilitating fractures are the osteoporotic fractures, is the hip fracture, and we'll talk about osteoporosis later on. 95% of hip fractures are caused by falls, and 20% of patients die within a year following a hip fracture. And that all depends on their chronic conditions, that they have heart conditions or all other um, medical conditions such as heart failure, hypertension, diabetes. So it's not just one incident. Okay, so just want to break it down. 40% of falls are unspecified falls. Okay, 24% of falls, people fall from the same level. They stumble, trip, or they slide. 
and then 17% are falls on the same level. Okay. Why do people fall? Normally it's a predisposing factor that is occurring. It could be an indication that you're having a stroke, a cardiac event such as an MI, or a GI bleed, or you could have an infection such as a UTI. Okay? Risk factors for falls. All of these in little circles, aging, greater than 80, medications, which we'll talk about, medical conditions, you have an imbalance in your gait, and also balance impairment, vision, hearing impairment, cognitive impairment, such as dementia or delirium, muscle weakness, you're not properly hydrated, lack of diet, uh, lack of exercise, alcoholism, people who are using poly substance abuse or drinking, okay? Um, risky taking behaviors, those who are climbing stairs with, um, or getting on step stools, reaching for things in their cabinets when they really shouldn't be, do because they have imbalance already, environmental hazards, females, And this here is talking about the risk factors with falls in your age category. So again, the intrinsic factors include hearing impairment, visual impairments, medications. It's a long list of medications. You guys, some of you guys are on the antidepressants, ditch, diuretics, so almost all medications can cause dizziness and cause falls. Alcoholism again. If you have hypertension, if you have osteoarthritis, if you have cardiac problems, with any type of bone issues, diabetes. Again, fear of falling. Once you fall, you're going to have that fear. Any type of cognitive status or any type of ability to maintain balance. The extrinsic factors include, as listed, environmental hazards, caregiver related factors, unsafe clothing and footwear, foot disorders, improper use of mobility aids, and so on and so on. Now, we look at the cause and the effect. We have mental health. The Alzheimer's disease, confusion, the paranoia, we have weakness and, and frailty, vision defects, cataracts reduce vision, musculoskeletal arthritis, if the need is given away, neurological, Parkinson's disease, any type of heart problem which includes any type of arrhythmia, poor environmental, poor lighting, carpets that are not um, fixed to the, to the floor, um, not having the proper um, balance, balancers in your, in your uh, apartments, improper housekeeping, and then the effect, the bruising, the fractures, the brain trauma, the burns, dehydration, pneumonia, and even death, okay? And then you have, of course, the Im immobility. <coughs> Once you fall, again, you have reduced activity, loss of muscle, tone, stiffness, mental, a fall results with, again, depression, loss of confidence, fear, and just an alteration of your lifestyle, and then the social, once you fall, you may have a, you don't want to leave home because you're fearful of falling. You may need long-term care. You may not be able to travel. And then you may not be able to do the things that you enjoy. So what are the non-modifiable fall risk factors? You can't control your age. You can't control your race. You can't control your gender. You can't control the history of prior falls. Okay? Certain diseases, strokes, Parkinson's, dementia, vision problems, you can't control that. But what you can control, and what we're here today is to tell you, you can control your muscle weakness, imbalance, your gait problems, your mobility deficits, if you're having syncope or, having, or you're passing out, orthostatic hypotension, polypharmacy, any type of medication, and also incontinence. So, syncope, those who pass out, is that considered a fall? Is that a fall? Right? Is that a fall? Okay, all right. So, are falls preventable? Yes, they are preventable. I want you guys to know, falls are preventable. We're going to talk about how they are preventable. Okay. After a fall, you guys mentioned, check for your injuries. Okay. Call for help if needed. Seek medical attention right away. Even if you don't hit your head, you should seek medical attention. Some people say, well, I'll just wait and don't. If you, don't if, you seek your, if you hit your head, you should definitely go to the ER. If you don't hit your head, come and see us the next day or either go to the urgent care. Call your, pra your practitioner, <coughs> doctor or nurse practitioner, check, check for safety hazards and learn how to get up safely. Now, so when you come to us, we're going to ask you a variety of questions. We're going to say, what happened? Most people fall at the same time every day. Okay? It may be at night time that they fall. Or they find that you know, they're going to the bathroom at 2 o'clock in the morning every day and they fall. Okay? Or 
So we're going we're to ask you, tell us, why, how did you fall? Did you fall just walking normally? Did you feel dizzy? Were you not feeling well? Were you feeling foggy a couple of days before? You want to know the location of where you, where you fell. What were you doing at the time? And what injuries occurred during the fall? We're also going to ask um, if you had any change of your level of consciousness. Did you, did you pass out when you fell? Did you have chest pain? Any palpitations? Were you dizzy? Any vertical? Or did you feel lightheaded? When you change your position from standing to sitting, do you feel dizzy? So when you come to us, that's why we always do an orthostatic change. We check your blood pressure sitting and standing for that reason. We need to know if there is a change that may be contributing to your dizziness. We're going to ask you if you had a headache, any weakness, tingling, numbness, any change in your mentation, again, that occurred prior to that, uh, which may indicate a stroke, or Sometimes a change in your cognition, it's a subtle change in your cognition, could be indicative of a urinary tract infection. We're going to ask for your medication, including anticoagulants. Are you on Coumadin? Are you on Plavix? Okay. Because if you're on the anticoagulants, such as um, warfarin or Eliquis, and if you bump your head, you can get a subdural hematoma. So you definitely need to get a go to the emergency room right away if you hit your head, so they can do the x-ray. And then we're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions, too, regarding your other disease process. So the physical exam, again, we're going to focus on the cause of the fall, okay? Why you fell, where did you hurt. It's important to find out about your vision. When was the last time you had your, your eyes checked, okay? Um, again, checking for any type of irregularities in your heart. Checking, doing our, our musculoskeletal. We always have you guys come in move all your arms and your legs to see exactly if you have any limitation in your range of motion. <coughs> Check to see if you're delirious. If you have a urinary tract infection, most people indicate that a couple of days before they felt kind of lightheaded and foggy. It's just something on the right. So we always check that to make sure we do a urine test on you to make sure you, if you had an infection uh, by way of a dipstick. We're going to have you um, refer you to physical therapy for testing, which we'll talk about later. The x-rays, all the stuff here, if you go to the emergency room, they'll draw there. If you come to us, we'll get laughs according to your presentation. Typically, there will be some blood tests done. We're going to have you go to the community radiology for your x-rays if you think anything's broken. If you hit your head, please go to the emergency room because you need to have a CT scan or MRI done, particularly if you're on anticoagulation medication. I can't emphasize that enough. And you got to make sure you don't have any type of hemorrhage. The EKG may be done if you have any type of arrhythmias. And the echo will refer you to cardiology. And again, if you have any vision problems, we'll refer you to ophthalmology. So these are things that we do. The DEXA bone scan, again, osteoporosis is indicative of um, fractures, particularly in females. So DEXA scans are recommended every two years. Okay. Uh, but we need to get a baseline to find out if you are osteoporotic, and if you are, we can put you on the proper medications. And then we always check, your, as I mentioned before, what the static changes. Any questions before we go on? Any questions? Yes. It's also important to use your proper equipment, assisted, you know, equipment like cane walker when you are moving around so that you don't fall. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have uh, knee surgeries or anything that you have surgery on your legs, you need to use your assisted equipment mm -hmm. like cane or walker or, you know, other assisted, uh, uh, you know, uh, help. Devices. Well, we'll take yes. it. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. So let's say you fell down and and you felt it was appropriate to go to the health center. Um, and as a result of your questions and your evaluations, you recommend some outside tests. Who, take, who keeps charge of the follow-up after that? Is, are you essentially shifted over to the doctors, let's say at MedStar General, or do you get the data back to your facility and do you take charge of following up with that person Who's in charge and what is your role? I guess is my question. So you come to us, you fail, and you may have a broken arm. Okay, so we'll 
first of all, if we think it's broken, we'll have you go to the emergency room. If, if, if we don't think it's broken, we'll still have you get an x-ray just to make sure it's not broken. If we refer you to community radiology, we would check, we would follow up. If you go to community radiology and they say that you have a compound fracture or a severe fracture, we'll have you go to the emergency room. The emergency room will send us information about what's going on, and then you follow up the next day or within two or three days with your primary provider. At the facility? At, at Leisure World. Do you have, does anyone in your facility have rights to order things in MedStar to communicate with the surgeons or the specialists there? Well, we do have a, a system that we do communicate to, to, to each other, yes we do. So for example, if you go to the emergency room, most of the time they'll call you the Dr. Feldman, whoever the provider is, and let them know what's going on. So we do have a um, collaborative communication going on with the providers at Montgomery General. And also, if, mm -hmm. if I can add something to, I'm Cam Hassan, I'm the manager of uh, the medical center. Uh, we actually brought in a specialist, an orthopedist, who is practicing Monday and Thursday, and I'm sorry I'm doing this plug, um, but uh, Monday mornings and Thursday mornings, so we actually have that specialist on site as well. The x-ray, we are referring out to community radiology as of now, but we are planning to put in a general purpose x-ray uh, in the next coming months. So, I will definitely do my best to keep everyone updated in regards to that. But the specialist is on site, but you have to make an appointment with the specialist. Correct. And Correct. you can't go through your prior primary and caregiver to make that appointment. Because you're the person in between, right? Well, typically you come to us through your provider, yes. and we will refer you accordingly. So I was trying to follow up with your question. Right. Back to the primary care person. Well, to the I hope things have changed because as I told you earlier, we were told that your facility has no rights, whatever the terminology is, in MedStar, and that you do not talk to, nor will you call those doctors to sort of translate what the two or three different specialists that's have said. That's 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 well, that's definitely what happened. So well, um, wrong. Yeah, and I apologize, Lewis, honestly, for the past, but we're moving on to the future, and well, we're definitely going to be true. coordinating much better. Thank you for the feedback, though. Anybody else have a question? Yes. So the question is... So you come see me? Yeah, the question is, if you have weak legs, what happens? We're going to talk about all that, okay? We'll talk about it in a minute. Okay? So medications. Medication is the bane of our society, right? Who doesn't take medications? The more medication you take, the more problems for interactions, the more problems for side effects. Studies have shown nine or more medications. Now, how many people are taking nine medications? How many people are taking more than nine medications? More than nine. Okay, so the more medication you take, the more interactions, the more chance of problems occurring, particularly if you're coming down with an infection. What about supplements? I'm sorry? If we take, besides the prescription supplement. Besides prescription supplements. Supplement. Right, so we look at supplements, we look at everything. Over-the-counter, over-the-counter medications. <laughs> All of that is considered medication because they have interactions. And we need to know what they are. So whenever you guys come in, you should bring your brown bag of medication so we can look at all the medications, including supplements, herbs, everything, all, everything. Prescription, okay, we need to know that. So where do we begin? Diuretics, the hydrochlorothiazide, the furosemide, the Lasix, anything that has any type of diuresis can cause dizziness, it can cause falls. Antihypertensive medication, all of them have side effects of dizziness, majority of them do. You guys have to let us know when you're feeling dizzy particularly when you started on a new medication, so we can monitor, check your blood pressure, particularly your orthostatic blood pressure, and adjust the medication accordingly, okay? Sedatives, hypnotics. How many people need medication to go to sleep? Your Zopidin, your Ambien. How many people require that? Anybody? Nobody? Yeah. Nobody needs a medication to go to sleep. Okay, okay, so, so again, what happens when you guys, we give you guys the Ambien and the orders open then, or any sleeping pill, insurance people call us and say, you guys are over 65 years old, why are we giving you this medication? Why? Because they know that those hypnotic medications can cause problems. What we have to do is document that, guess what, they've been on these medications for years, 
without any daytime excessive sleepiness, without any falling, it's safe to be on the medication. Okay, that's why we ask you guys if you're on there, or some doctors say, we're not giving you the medication because insurance companies are telling us not to do it. What I do, I just have to document accordingly that you guys are tolerating it well without any falls. Antipsychotics, the Seroquel, any type of medication that causes um, with depression and bipolar, we have to, again, that can make you fall. And then any antidepressant medication. So prevention, okay? The whole purpose is addressing the risk factors, advocating for exercising, including strength and balance training, review of medication, make sure that every year you're getting your vision checked. Some people need to have it done twice a year, depending on if you're diabetic or if you have other issues going on. Conducting a home safety eval, and then also making modifications as needed. So, recommendations include exercise or physical therapy, calcium with vitamin D because of the osteoporosis, okay? And this is a, these are guidelines that are recommended. Although the meta-analysis does not show any benefit, we still put you guys on the calcium and vitamin D because some of us do feel that it is beneficial. Okay, rugs. Okay, if they're not secured to the floor, you have to remove them because again, there are big risk factors for falling. Okay? So remove your clutter, remove your throw rugs, they're not affixed to the floor, look for other environmental hazards, install stairwells or banisters, install the high chairs for the, for the toilets so that you guys can get up easy. We have, they have high toilets. If you need rails to, to help you stand up, please do that. Develop a good buddy system. So if you fall, okay, and, and People don't hear from you in a couple hours or however you guys, within a day, somebody knows to go ahead and call. Have your children call you at least twice a day. Buy a lifeline. How many people have lifelines? That's not a lot of people. So if you fall and you can't get up, who are you going to notify? Who? I carry a button. You carry a button. Oh, the button does what? <laughs> it alerts the, uh, this is where you call. Okay. And as soon as I push it, they ask me what my problem is. They have my medical history, and they send help. Okay. So how many other? Go ahead. The what phone? It detects my phone. Okay. You have one that detects your fall. So how many? So you guys do not have those who don't have the lifeline. If you fall and can't get up, what happens? And nobody calls you within a day. What happens? No. Not when your neighbor right. 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 Right but they're not good for, particularly those who have far risk. These are the proper shoes you should wear, okay? Those that enhance stability, okay? I know they're not fashionable, but you have to wear them if you are a far risk. You should, I recommend any way you wear them, okay? So look into, they have a shop, I believe, in the, um, by Giant, that you can buy proper shoes. <coughs> Exercises are recommended, and I'm gonna have Dion take over. Okay. Well, I, I know we're going we're gonna to talk about this more in the breakout sessions okay. so that we can keep, we okay. can keep moving. But okay. if you have questions about physical therapy, I know the lady in the back had a okay. question about what exercises okay. to do. Make sure you stop on by. I'll be here to answer all of your questions. Okay. okay. So real quick, these are the, we're going to talk about the exercises that are recommended in the session. And then consider please getting a home safety avail. If you fall, please get a home safety avail by your occupational therapist. Have your medication review by the pharmacist at our facility or by your nurse practitioner or your doctor. Whenever you come in, you should always have your medication reviewed. Again, have your annual eye exams. Removal of cataracts if it's appropriate. We're going to talk about that later on. In summary, so the case study, basically you guys all gave good information. We need for you guys to utilize your social worker, have your medications reviewed, get your assessment done. Um, and yeah, okay, and that's it. Okay, so basically, <laughs> basically, leaves are supposed to fall, people aren't. Please remember that. Ah, okay? I like that.
say one thing again. I want to introduce my team, okay? So I have Dee Nastic here. She is the manager for the um, nursing staff. Dion Hawkins is the physical therapy manager. And we have Cam Hassan, who is our administrator. As he mentioned, we have a whole new team here. So please, if you have any questions or any problems, feel free to reach out to him, please. Him or Dee. Okay. Thank you.